somewhere under this grass is a Roman cemetery containing the remains of soldiers from all over the empire who were stationed here in South Shields. We know it's here because Victorian builders found loads of bodies. The fort was in use for 300 years, so the cemetery could be huge. And it's not just full of your average Roman squaddies. There were troops from Spain and Africa. There's even an intriguing reference to what could be a unit of Iraqis. There's just one tiny problem. The whole thing is under a housing estate. And we've got just three days to try and crack it. Well, what we're seeing is mainly all the Victorian houses. We think there were two street lines here, one at the front, and one at the back. Running Running this parallel way. Yeah, with yeah. the road, yeah. Mm -hmm. and we think in the middle of the trench we may be into the yard. So that's houses, courtyard houses. That's right. Yeah. But this is all disturbing our results. It's only when we go to the radar, this is the disturbance, the Victorian rubble. But you can see these responses below. What we wonder is whether that's the archaeology. And that's what we want to see. Could it just be the deep foundations it of the houses? It could be the deep foundations mm -hmm. of the houses. And the only way we'll find out is by digging. The Victorian builders are a tough act to follow. They found some amazing stuff, like this. Right in the middle of our site, they unearthed two of the finest Roman tombstones in Britain. Roman South Shields was clearly a microcosm of the whole empire. This test pit will be here in the middle of the estate. Others will be in an arc running up to Trench 2, which is being dug to look for the northern boundary of the cemetery. But the first indications aren't hopeful. Phil's come down onto concrete where we might have expected the demolition rubble of Victorian houses. And Bridget's bogged down in modern services, gas, water and electricity pipes. The population of the Vicus and the fort might have been more than a thousand. During the 300-odd years of the fort's life, thousands of people would have died in Arbea. They must have been buried somewhere. Stuart's trying to work out whether the shape of the landscape in Roman times offers any clues as to where the cemetery might have been. Bridget in Trench 1 has found a way through the services. Have you found any Roman features? Well, no, not yet. Um, we just seem to be going through this Victorian mm -hmm. makeup mm -hmm. layer debris. But then Ray's been up here and uh -huh. he has found three bits of um, medieval pots. We've got the green glaze. Oh, there. yeah, that's good, isn't it? Amazing. So Bridget's got another 1,400 years to go if she's going to find the western boundary of the cemetery. Phil, though, in Trench 2, can't get any deeper. Twelve years of time, team, tells me that this isn't Roman, Phil. No, I don't think I've ever found a vehicle inspection pit before, Tony. <laughs> <laughs> I'm blaming him. You know, when we put this trench in, I was expecting the foundations of a Victorian <laughs> terrace. We actually got something, Bridge. Well, yeah, we have. It's the first feature in this trench. This is a regular shaped cut here. It's cutting through this windswept, redeposited sand and inside it we've got bands, distinct bands of clay and then dirty sand and then clay and then dirty sand again. Do you reckon that's something created by humans? It looks like it to me. If you look at that nice um, vertical edge there, the sharpness of the cut, it looks like uh, an intrusion that's been deliberately dug. This could be a, a, a Roman feature. Roman grave? I'm not really sure. It has the feel to me in this, in a sort of sand subsoil like this, perhaps a, a natural feature. You know, with uh, heavy rain leading to uh, hollows forming, clay in the bottom of the hollows as it dries out, windblown sand, more clay. So what are we going to do with it? Well, I think we need to get to the bottom of it. One of the problems is, though, what we'll find, because in sand... Well, exactly, but I don't think we're going to find much evidence of any bone left within the sand, because it just disappears pretty so quickly. Does that mean that we can't prove whether it's a grave or not? Oh, no, because uh, in, in a Roman grave, especially in a military cemetery, you would expect to get grave goods. So even with no preservation of bone, it is possible to prove a, a Roman grave. Here you go, Phil. In Trench 4, there's already a strong sniff of Roman in the finds. Yeah, it's quite a nice, bold rim, isn't yeah. it, really? Yeah. It's Very been knocked old. around a bit. Totally but that's the last piece of archaeology yeah. Matt Williams will see for 24 hours. <laughs> Instead of evidence of dead people, we're getting traces of occupation where people lived. 
Oh, well, it's obvious that's Gaulish Samian ware, imported from Roman Gaul. And I can tell straight away, this is a very rare form. You know those mortaria, those Roman kitchen mixing bowls? With the grits inside. That's right, for grinding mm -hmm. up the food, mm -hmm. very characteristic mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. Roman cooking. This is a very rare Samian form of mortarium. It's got a kind of vertical wall around the edge here with a very characteristic little lion's head spout on one side and then the bowl down here with the grits. You can actually see some of the grit there. Mm. It's not the sort of thing I'd expect to find in a grave though. I think that's occupational debris. Mm. With the Vicus appearing to stretch further south than previously thought, the Roman map of South Shields is being redrawn. Phil, I can't believe this. You only had a couple of pieces before lunch. What's... <laughs> in Trench 4, Phil's flow of finds has turned into a flood. But the story is still settlement, not cemetery. I mean, look at this. We've got this loads of same in us. That's yeah. probably my favourite. It's nicely decorated. Actually, it's not that wonderful, you know. If you look at the rosettes, they're very worn down and it's got that rather smudgy orange colour. I think this is East Gaulish, you know, late 2nd century, early 3rd century. It's come across from the Rhineland. <laughs> well, were they notable for their crappy well, Samian? Well, actually, <laughs> actually, they weren't very good at it and it, it's not that... It's quite distinctive, actually, but it's a good date, though. And then we've also got these colour-coated, which they, they, yeah. I love that sort of decoration. Yeah, that's one of those little... Beer drinking beakers. Beer drinking. That's right. <laughs> I approve of that, yeah. <laughs> but this one, I think, has come from the Neen Valley, Cambridgeshire, near Peterborough, right. that sort of area. And then we've got more roulette in as well. Oh, yeah, yeah, see, that colour makes me think this is from North Gaul. Yeah. So quite, yeah. You know, what's really interesting about that is it sort of shows all the trade routes that have gone up here. I mean, we know the place was a port, don't we? So a lot of this stuff would have been shipped in up the East Coast or across the North Sea. Among the finds turned up by Victorian builders were a number of skulls, all of which show signs of trauma. That's wounds to you and me. Even a supply base like Arbea would have seen its share of frontline action, and the actual wounds have been intriguing our bones experts. We've got these skulls, and a lot of them have got cut marks on like these. You can see caused by a very sharp blade, and another one there, and another one there. These are obviously inflicted when this poor bloke was down on his knees probably by somebody who was in a bit of a frenzy of killing and there's a lot of evidence of that but this one's probably the most unusual one of all because you've got this depressed fracture um, where the bone is still attached on the inside and you've got the signature of the weapon that actually caused that here so we're experimenting to see if we can actually establish what type of weapon caused that signature <laughs> It's not clear whether the wounds were inflicted on Romans or by Romans. You can see what it's done. You can see that it's crushed the bone there and then there's a fracture leading up here. So we are starting to get these radiating fractures coming out, but it still doesn't look like that, does it, Margaret? It doesn't, no. My money's on this, Tony. I think the only thing that's the right sort of size with enough velocity to cause this sort of damage is, is something like shot or, or a stone even that would have actually impacted like that. Slingshots were used by both local Britons and the Romans. That does look uh, pretty plausible. It does, isn't it? it's quite convincing, I think. At last, I one of know. our test pits is delivering Roman finds. The question is could they be from burials? Yes. Oh, yes. 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 Right, that's from a nice little piece of flagon. There's the main body. And then that's up to the rim. Unfortunately, without the handle yeah. or the proper rim, it's going to be very hard to date that. But that's guaranteed Roman period. Mm -hmm. Now, a flagon is the sort of thing you could get in a cremation burial mm -hmm. as a grave good, but it's more likely that this is just a normal flagon yeah. from everyday use, part mm -hmm. of everyday life in the Vicus, that's it, really. Yeah. Trench four is becoming our hot trench. Not the roadside burials that Stuart expected, but instead signs of settlement in the form of a midden or rubbish dump. And now it's thrown up another surprise. Nick, would you care to have a look at this? Incredibly compact, hard surface. Wow, that is hard, isn't it? That's real metalling. I mean, is this the sort of surface that you get from your Roman roads up yes, here? Yes, it looks Roman to me, given the amount of Roman material we've had off the top of it. Oh, it's there. It's there. It's there. There it is. Oh, God, I ain't still going. A Roman road, another yeah. sign of life where we expected to find death. 
it's becoming a real puzzle trying to work out what happened to all those people who must have died at Arbea. Were they all in one cemetery? Carenza's trying to find out whether the layout of other Roman fort sites can tell us why the cemetery here is so elusive. The answer may be both simple and devastating. The problem is that the cemetery may well be a lot smaller and a lot more compact, and perhaps several cemeteries. What we may be hitting is the gaps in between. I think what we really need to do from the archaeological point of view is start as close as possible to any spot where we know we've had human remains in the ground. But that's the exact opposite of what Tim told us the strategy was at the beginning. He said, start wide out and work in. And it hasn't worked. Two new trenches are planned. The first close to an earlier excavation which found part of a Roman burial. 20 metres away, Geophys are surveying our second target. A previous test pit here found part of a curving ditch which could have ringed a Roman barrow burial. We want to find out if it did. The only problem is we know that the area is packed with gas, water and electricity service pipes. It's now nearly lunchtime. Talk about last orders at the last chance saloon. Anything in here? Well, there would have been, but unfortunately, we've got Service City here. I mean, old Victorian services, some of which we couldn't have we couldn't have picked up. Damn. So and nothing, nothing else. Nothing else, I'm afraid. No. What about over here? Well, down here, where we had highest hopes of finding a burial, more services. So what are we going to do? We've got one chance, I think. This is the geophysics, we've now extended. They're the trenches. Look at that, that stands out like a sore thumb. We, we can't ignore that. It might only be more Victorian cellars, but given the circumstances, we've got to go for it. Perhaps it is one option and it's just down here, but I haven't given up over here. Uh, we've still got lots of services, though. Well, there are services, but there's a gap just up here, right on the edge of the site. <laughs> what, from the, the edge of this pavement down to this... Orange line. Tim, that is an act of desperation. Yeah, absolutely not. We've got this trench we're going to put in here and we're going to go down there. Where the pegs are. We've marked it out. Well, we'll have dug up the whole estate then, won't we? Pretty much, but that's the way it goes. Flipping heck. <laughs> so, two new trenches are going in. One to investigate John's anomaly and the other as close to point H as we can get. But it feels like desperation. We're no longer looking for a cemetery, we're looking for a single grave. And our best bet may still be the possible barrow burial in Trench 7, even though it's been damaged by services. Tim, I remember the night before we started. There you were, first time that you'd run a time team dig. Mm -hmm. And what you were worried about was how we were going to process this wealth of archaeology which was going to gush up out of the <laughs> earth as soon as you put a trench in. Yep, and it's been rather different, hasn't it? Why? I think it's because um, the land surface we see now is very different from the Roman underlying surface and we didn't realise how variable the geology was. You know, sand this deep in one place, clay in natural hollows, gullies and things that we didn't imagine were going to be there at all. But this is quite interesting, isn't it? Well, it is, because, in fact, the archaeology in here, although it's not symmetry, I think is beginning to make me feel we can tie it all together. In what way? Well, underneath that midden, you know, the, the rubbish deposit that Phil found yesterday, we discovered a, a cobbled path, which I think Phil's glorified with the name of a road. Mm. It's not what you'd call grade one standard major Roman road, but it's still a path, and it's on this particular alignment leading down towards the known burials. And that makes me excited, because I think we're getting the idea of a path leading towards the burials. Why do you say you're beginning to be able to tie everything together? Well, because we found these same cobbles in the next trench down, even closer to the cemetery. Bridget's Trench? Absolutely, yeah. So this pathway thing is heading through that trench and on to Carenza's glorious point H. Absolutely, that's, that's what we think, yeah. And what's more, we've discovered something new in the last half an hour, which I think makes that idea even more positive. Tell me. Well, you can see the road, or rather what's left of it, down here. But we've just discovered the ditch on the same alignment towards the far side, running through the yellow sand, that grey band. The previous excavation that did find burials was defined by ditches. 
on exactly this alignment. And I think we found the edge of their cemetery plot. Which is what we came to look for, wasn't yeah. it? The definition of Ab the cemetery. Absolutely. But it would be nice to find a burial, wouldn't it? There's just a chance that we may have found something. What? Well, over in the section of the trench there, Bridge, I think, thinks she may have found something cut in the ditch that looks a bit like a burial. Do you think you might actually have a grave cut? Yeah, well, I certainly hope so. Look, you can see it. Clay inside, quite a square-looking feature. And on this site, there has been Roman graves found cut into gullies before. Well, that's the most optimistic thing I've heard for several hours. A grave would be fantastic news. And there's more good news from the children of the local junior school, who've produced an impressive haul of finds from their test pits. They've actually found a lot of Roman pottery, Love considering it. what a small area has been opened up. They've done very well indeed, they really have. Can you give them an idea of what was going on in the Roman period on this spot from what they found? Well, I can see straight away there's a really nice little collection of Roman kitchenware. This is the kind of material that was used every day in a Roman kitchen. It would pick up contaminants from the food and they'd throw it away on a fairly regular basis, much as we would throw away paper plates, polystyrene containers, that sort of thing. This is the kind of material that would have been used in the houses in the Vicus where the families of the soldiers who lived in the fort were having their ordinary everyday lives. But where were the beggars buried? Not here. John's anomaly has turned out to be a dump of bricks. Possibly here, next to point H. But because of the services, we'll never know. Is it another one of those services? There's a big, big void in here, look. Even more disappointingly, Bridget's possible grave cut has turned out to be a natural feature, though the trench has produced a fine Samian sherd. <laughs> it's a really nice piece, but a stag there, all these decorative features, mm. mass-produced by one of the huge factories in central Gaul, central France, mm. shipped into Britain by the tonne. Sort of what date are we talking? Round about the middle of the second century, so about the time that the stone fort was built. We have got one big bit of bone, which is in that tray there. Where did this come from? It's from a level which is much nearer the level of the road surface, um, just about this sort of height in the section. Oh, that black stuff, or...? No, just below that. Just oh, right, below that. OK. Well, is, is it this... human? I think it probably human? is. Which bit of the body? It looks like a chunk of upper arm from quite a chunky arm as well. But to be sure... The possible cremation pit turned out to be a prehistoric feature, but the human bone shows there was a burial nearby. 20 metres away, Bridget's Trench has also finally produced intriguing evidence that we are close to the cemetery. Ditches on the right alignment, and now, what could be even more positive, bone. The question is, what sort of bone? It's in such awful condition. It's, it's certainly not cremated bone. I mean, it's uh, mostly from long bones, but, my goodness, it's the consistency of toothpaste. Yeah, it's just rotten, it's falling yeah. apart. This is obviously why we're not recovering any skeletons here, isn't it? This soil's so acidic that bone's just decaying. Whether or not it's human, we now know that we're close to the cemetery, or one of them. It was small and couldn't have held all of our bayers dead, so there must have been other cemeteries. This one was prominently placed crowning a hill with access along Phil's track. We now also know that the Vika stretched further down than previously thought, forming the northern boundary. The main road south from the fort was the eastern limit. To the south, there was marshy ground unsuitable for burials. Time Team is 100% independent and funded by our incredible fans. Want us to make more episodes? Joining Patreon gives you access to exclusive interviews 3D models, masterclasses, and more. And you get to have your say in the process as we develop new sites. This is Littlington in Cambridgeshire. On the face of it, it's a quintessential English village. You see the medieval church over there, and right behind the camera over here, there's the post office and village store, and round this corner here, the village pub. I think I know a few people who'll be interested in that. So far, so what? Well, there's more to this place than meets the eye. 
because the people of Littlington believe their village may hide one of the best-kept Roman secrets in Britain. And with good reason. 180 years ago, a local vicar put a trench in this field and decided it was the site of one of the biggest Roman homes in Britain. But not only that, another dig about the same time claimed to have found a beautiful walled Roman cemetery a few hundred yards away, probably part of the same complex. So you've got this massive villa, an elaborate cemetery. This stuff ought to be in the history books. Only problem is, nearly all the records have been lost. Well, the first thing we need to do is actually find out just how accurate this plan is because if it's correct, then we could be looking at one of the biggest villas ever discovered in Britain. But so while we wait for a geophys target in the main field, we're going to have a quick rummage in the cops to see how it fits into our Roman story. Um, oh, you're not using saws, Phil. You're going hey? straight for just bulldozing well, no, this out is, the this is... And that means we need to do a spot of light deforestation. That's better, isn't it? Where do you want to put it, though? I don't... <laughs> so with finds from around the village and evidence of something quite substantial in this copse, it would seem that whatever was here covered a large area. Oh, look. There's another one. Oh, Tessera. Tessera, Anna. Yeah. There's another one here. It's obviously part of a, a Roman pavement. I mean, whether, wow. it's, whether it's in situ or whether it's just been dumped in here, this is a sort of million dollar question. And a villa is the sort of archeological target that should positively scream its presence on the geophys results. Oh boy. Well, we're not seeing a villa in that data. We're not seeing anything like the responses that we should be getting. Oh dear. Well, that's not the sort of response I was expecting. But there's a chance we've asked him to geophys the wrong part of the field. Because, as Stuart and Helen are discovering, the antiquarian map may not be as reliable as we first hoped. There are bits of this map which actually look fine in relation to, to the later mapping, yeah. and there are bits which look completely wrong. Oh. It, <laughs> it's like a half-right map is this at the moment. But when you get further south here towards this road junction, this is where it starts to go a bit, a bit wayward because that's quite some distance from the modern south end of the village. This map is from just one of many digs carried out here by antiquarians. Vickers, doctors and the like, who were the predecessors of today's archaeologists. But although their intentions were honourable, their record-keeping could be somewhat poor. Now, in 1913, the Cambridge Antiquarian Society comes to Littlington to visit Mr McLaren at Manor Farm because he's found a bit of a villa and they view the, the, uh, um, the excavations and they have tea in the garden. It sounds <laughs> lovely. Do we have the report? Not yet, and, and in fact, I think we may never find one because they don't seem to have been terribly impressed at what they found. They said, although there was an extensive building, there were only foundations left and um, finds were only really pottery. It seems crazy to me that we've got all these late 19th, early 20th century references to this site, but really no tangible written evidence. What are we going to do? Phil, Raksha, what have you got down in the woods? <laughs> But our scratching around in the copse has just produced some lovely Roman archaeology. There's just enough here to indicate that we do have a floor and that that's where they come from. Oh, good grief. This really is a cracking little discovery, although it's much too early to say what kind of building this stretch of paving belongs to. This is Littlington in Cambridgeshire, and this morning in this field I was offered not just a Roman villa, but a palatial Roman villa, 300 foot by 500 foot. And the big news is, we can't find it. See that geophys? There's nothing there at all except these odd trackway things. We can't even put in a trench because we haven't got any targets. Where's my villa? <laughs> Look, we're doing pretty well. We've got stuff over there in the cops. We've got a tessellated pavement there. But I will admit, we haven't so far got a massive villa in this part of the field. So what do we do? We're not going to give up. Um, 
Instead of going for the digital method, though, we're going to try the analogue method and actually trust to the maps and see what they come up <laughs> what with. What does he mean by the analogue method? I don't know, but he's looking at me when he <laughs> said it. <laughs> okay. At the moment, the, the only real evidence we've, we've got that ever was a villa in this field is this one plan that was made in the early 19th century showing what looks like a courtyard villa. So what we're looking at, if, if we accept this as it is, and we don't know how reliable it is, that there is a rectangular villa type structure extending down towards that copse under those houses up there and, and back up if we take that as gospel and it's the only thing we've got at the moment which actually says there might be a villa in this field so our first trench in this massive field goes in on the basis of a single 170 year old map It's hardly the most scientifically robust target we've ever had, but then again... Hold them in. Hey! What's that? Bit of Roman roof tile. After the frustration of this morning, it's good to know that we seem to be in the right place. Oh! Oh! Ah, no, look <laughs> at that. That is... that's the edge, I I mean, look at the alignment. The alignment mm. of that wall is exactly yeah. the same alignment as our pavement here. So we're going to put in a couple of trenches in the copse to see if there is potentially a bathhouse buried under all this shrubbery. Tessery number one. <laughs> in the space of a couple of hours, we've gone from twiddling our thumbs to being stretched to the limit. We've got a doorway. A door? Yeah. Really? Check it out. Oh! oh, oh isn't that fantastic? Oh, that's brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> it's, even, it's even invented, isn't it? Absolutely. So there we go, a Roman doorway. Absolutely brilliant. The evidence we're finding in here certainly suggests we may be coming down onto something posh enough to belong to a high-status Roman villa. Ooh, that's painted wall plaster. It's got blue and green on as well. That's absolutely fantastic. Or maybe I spoke too soon. Just after lunch, we put a trench in over here, even though we couldn't see anything in the geophys, because Stuart had worked out that this on the 19th century drawing is where the villa should be. So we thought, well, we'd dig it and see if the antiquarians were right. Although, Matt, I can't quite see a villa there. That's because there isn't a villa in there. In fact, there's not even the remnants of a villa anywhere nearby here. So what's this recess here? Well, what we've got here is what the geophysics showed, which was a great big linear coming all the way through, back up there. There's a parallel one just beyond the edge of the trench there. And we've also got another ditch coming straight across it that just way. Just a minute. Isn't that Roman tile? It, it doesn't tell us anything about what's going on in this trench. The only recognisable archaeology in this trench is a medieval trackway. There's absolutely no trace of anything structural slap bang in the middle of where we expected to find our record-breaking villa. Frankly, this is a bit of a disaster. I'm going to ask Ben the question that no one else seems to have the bottle to ask you. Suppose there isn't a villa here at all. I think we've definitely got a villa. I mean, you don't get that amount of building material, you don't get the tessellated pavement, the wall plaster, all these finds without there being a villa here. There, there must be a villa here. What about the one tangible piece of evidence we've got, the cops? What's going on there? Clearly an important building or part of a building. I mean, have, have a look at this. I mean, we could be talking about a, a bathhouse, for example, typically a bit peripheral or, or, or you know, towards the edge of the, uh, of the area because of the fire risk. Um, could it be that it's one of the reception rooms? Nice mosaic in there. Could it be even one of the main living spaces. We, we haven't got quite enough to go on. It might then acquire... Well, Ben's big, shiny, graphic imaginings are all well and good. But they're quite a leap from the reality of the site that so far produced quite a lot of nothing. Our villa is over there where those houses are. In fact, quite a lot of it's probably under those houses. But somewhere in this field, we think there might be a rare walled Roman cemetery which would be associated with the villa. Except nobody really knows precisely where it is, do they? Well, I, I think we do now. Oh, there was triumph <laughs> in that tone. Well, why? Well, we've done the magnetic survey. and Look, Ben's got the results here. 
this ditch here turns through a right angle and I just wonder whether that could be the boundary of the cemetery. But back in the copse, there's been a breakthrough and Phil now thinks he is digging a bathhouse. But now we got down here, we've got this concrete type block in here. Now this is, um, well, I'm sure it's in situ. It's not a piece of loose debris. You've got, I mean, it's definitely, yeah, I mean, it's definitely sort of, you know, say brick stroke tile. So what you're trying to say is, I think you are right, Phil. I think you do have a bathhouse. You might be right, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Let's hope so. <laughs> oh, uh, get him in. And that means weeding on an industrial scale. We've now got just one day to get to the bottom of Roman Littlington. You want to come and have a look and see what we've done to your wood? <laughs> what have you done to us? Well, we've just given it a bit of daylight, you see. You've got to put a bit of daylight in here. Let's just hope the locals are still talking to us by this time tomorrow. At the moment, Phil suspects that at some point, the original floor of this building, which may or may not have been a plunge pool, had a hypercost, a heated floor system built on top of it. So far, so good. There obviously has got to be a hypercost. Logically, there's got to be a hypercost in here somewhere. Only if there's, it is a bathhouse. And we don't absolutely know that for certain, do we? Oh, dear. We well, might be. <laughs> <laughs> but Tony's going to love this when we change our opinions but yet again. He knew we would. Yeah, there's still, there's still Roman, bits of Roman stuff coming out of there. I just had a piece of tile out of it. And if dealing with one antiquarian site wasn't enough, there's the small matter of the walled cemetery that we suspect may be associated with our Roman building. Jackie, can I come in? Yeah, sure, come down the stairs. What is it you've got? Well, we know that in this field, this cemetery was discovered in about 1820 by gravel quarry diggers. Um, and they found the cemetery, the antiquarians came in, they dug out what they wanted, and they carried on digging gravel out of here for quite some time. And then they would have backfilled everything they the holes they'd left behind. And I was getting really despondent yesterday because we weren't finding any bits of material at all. And Fantastically, this morning, at about this level here, I turned up a whole load of human bone. Oh, fantastic. We've got bits of femur and bits of tibia from the leg bones. And even better, we had a piece of pottery turnip which has been dated at late, late Iron Age, early Romano British. So you're sure they're Roman bones? Yeah, this is, this is what they left behind of the, of the material from the cemetery that they didn't want to take away. John, looks like you were right. There's a cemetery here after all. Yeah, we knew it was here. It had to be on the basis of our results. Don't crow. <laughs> no. <laughs> what we've done this morning is expand our survey back in this field. So we're putting in one final trench over John's potential mausoleum, as it would be fantastic to establish that at least one Roman tomb has survived the 18th century gravel quarrying. This is, looks pretty solid. Here's the wall. Yeah. That's solid, it's coming down. Solid, solid. I think that might be the base of something. So it would seem that we may have at last uncovered some solid evidence of the Roman cemetery. And with only a few hours to go, it looks like we may have finally got a handle on this blasted villa. Oh, you've got your floor surface here. Really? Yeah. <laughs> Look in that corner. See how much more solid that is. Oh, yeah. Oh, what timing. Well, even I can tell that's a human skull there. Yeah. There was also, in there... Ah. That. Yes, that looks awfully like a coffin nail, doesn't mm. it? Yes. Yeah. This is intact, in yep. situ, it's not redeposited, mm -hmm. this is where the guy went in. Um, we've got somebody laid on their left side, mm -hmm. face, facing that direction. With Matt's trench confirming the presence of the mausoleum shown in John's Geophys, it's probably safe to suggest at least one or two other graves may also survive beneath this field. I think we can safely call that a result. Any ideas where it could be? <laughs> the one time in my life when I need a Romanist and there's never one here. But even at this late stage, the Romanists are continuing to frustrate Phil's quest for a final decision on what's in the cops. 
What is going on? Well, I don't know. That's why you're you're here to tell me. <laughs> right. Okay. Well, knowing what's happening in a bathhouse that hasn't been dug by someone, and one that's obviously been dug into, and, and elements removed, elements explored, taken away. That, that's that's two different things, really, isn't it? I mean, it is a it is a it is a bit of a a blow to the stomach, though. I mean, we've shifted a lot of muck today, and <laughs> and and we've worked hard, and yeah. and at the end of the day to turn round after all that graft and say we haven't got the foggiest idea. That's a bitter pill to swallow. I don't think we're saying we haven't got the foggiest well, idea. Well, you know, that's what you were saying to me, isn't it? What, 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 what is I'm it I'm saying then? it in what is it more then? words. What is it then? <laughs> We've got thick deposits of, of plaster and, and it looks like they've made a concerted effort to make some of these rooms perhaps watertight or at least to consolidate them. So is this a bathhouse? Yes. Well, there we go then. I'm happy with that. <laughs> This finely decorated bathhouse would have been a focus for any villa. And thanks to the results from the test bits and the bits of radar John could get from the back gardens, we think that the villa would have sat roughly in the area now occupied by these houses. But truthfully, that's about it. We can't really say what the villa looked like or what its relationship is to the cemetery we've discovered. No. So you may think that the great villa of Littlington doesn't exist, but we'd like to show you something else. Come over this way. It's been a frustrating and at times an infuriating three days here, but at least the people of Littlington now know what was going on here almost 2,000 years ago. We do know that in parts of this building there were some really expensive floors. We found not. And in spite of some people's misgivings, I have to say this site proves the benefits of digging into the past. You do have a villa, we believe it's under there, and you have a bathhouse which hopefully generations of children will be able to visit and learn more about the Romans from. So. Thanks ever so much for coming, and we had a good time. I hope you did too. <laughs> Thank you. Time Team is 100% independent and funded by our incredible fans. Joining Patreon gives you access to exclusive interviews, 3D models, masterclasses, and more. Please join us on this exciting journey. We need more support to make more episodes. Bedford Pearly Wood is in the Neen Valley in Cambridgeshire, about 15 miles from Peterborough. 1800 years ago, this was one of the wealthiest areas of Roman Britain, and our site would have been on the outskirts of Dura Breve, the main trading centre in the region. But while most Roman sites around here have been damaged by modern ploughing, it looks like whatever's hidden in these woods could be really well preserved. Our challenge is simple enough. What were the Romans doing here? But thanks to the trees, finding out isn't going to be that easy. The other problem is this is a national nature reserve and there's lots of protected plants here. John, you having a good day? Wonderful. For once, though, we don't have to wait for geophys because in some places we can actually see Roman walls on the surface. Look, no, this is silly. You can't have archaeology <laughs> just... It's sticking above the ground. Yeah. It's not under the ground. No doubt this is why the site was first discovered by an antiquarian back in the early 1800s. And it's because the remains are close to the surface that they've also shown up so well on this LiDAR picture. The colours, by the way, represent height with green marking the low ground and white the highest. Phil, are you sure we're digging in the right place? What do you mean, we're digging in the right place? Well, look at that, lovely and neat. Look at that, chaos. I don't actually regard that as extremely chaotic. Come and have a look. Sorry, there's a rather large archaeologist in my eye line. Look, we've got a nice, long, straight row here. It's all built of stone. And look, we've even got one stone on top of another stone. Now then, what would you call that? It's a wall. Thank you. I eat my words. That's right. What do you reckon we've got here? Well, you see, this is the problem. 
You've got that plan which shows a series of earthworks. Yeah. It is very, very easy to assume that all the upstanding bits are walls. Now, when they dug here a little earlier on, they know for a fact that where sometimes where there are earthworks, there weren't walls. Sometimes there were walls and there weren't earthworks. It is not as clear cut as that drawing suggests. We don't also know whether or not it's the same phase. So uh, there was some sense in my point. Just looking at this tumble doesn't necessarily mean that you can interpret where the building are. That is not your question. Your question was, are we digging in the right place? Yes, we're digging in the right place. <laughs> All right, I was wrong. <laughs> well, I'd say it's a floor tile. That, looks, that looks like Roman floor tile, doesn't Roman it? Roman yeah, floor yeah, tile, yeah. Yes, yeah very Promising. Good. Very good. So, Matt's wall is Roman. And I have to say, it does look suspiciously like it belongs to the same range of structures that Phil's digging some 80 metres away. There's still lots of rubble to remove, but already Phil's discovered the walls survive to some depth and in places are built with fragments of stone and tile creating a herringbone pattern. At the bottom, you can see the 80 metres away in our second trench, Matt's finding that the walls he's unearthed are built in exactly the same way. There's quite a few bits of floor tile out of there. Oh, all right. But I think right. these were actually built into the wall and have performed a part of the structure. Right, because you get layers of tile in Roman walls. So yeah. Mm. That rather suggests it is a building, I think. Yeah. yeah. And there's been a few bits of pottery as well. Oh, that's good, because there's very little from elsewhere. So what have you got? The, lo the local wares? Yeah, that's uh, Roman Neen Valley. Yeah. Um, and ah, we Which had... rather good. And we've also had a bit of iron ore as well. Ah, oh, no, that's good, because we've got a metallurgist coming tomorrow. So right. So you can, can have a look at that. Yeah. I'm in two minds, actually. It looks as if it could be a standard Roman villa, but the plan is suspicious, and I suspect the linking with ironworking is very intriguing. John's persisted in his search for evidence of metalworking. He's been using the MagSus, that's a magnetic susceptibility machine to you and me, and he now reckons he's getting very strong signals over here on the western edge of the site. I've agreed to meet Mick out there, and I shouldn't get lost if I just follow the signs. Two men and two signs. <laughs> oh, yeah, don't take a note of the signs. I wanted you to see this test pit here. A couple of years ago, we had a little test pit here. It's been fertiled around by animals now. But you can see there's a bit of walling here. But very importantly, this produced a couple of bits of, of slag. It doesn't look much, but slag is a byproduct of making iron and it could mean we've got a Roman iron smelting furnace nearby. There's a big enclosure around here. I mean, it, it's, it's probably too big for a building, Ben, isn't it? Well, yeah, I mean, unless it's a very big old barn or something like that, it's certainly very large. Yeah. John, have you managed to cover most of this? Well, we've done half the survey so far, and what's really interesting, here, to just show you the results. Look, the test pit is down here, and that's where you've got a bit of walling but I'm getting really strong readings here in red, and I've done half the survey so far, and I'm sure that this is the concentration of the area of burning. And just look at the soil. Look here, it's really gray. Whereas in here, in amongst the trees, look, it's in silly, see the red clay. This is the concentration of the burning. But, professional to the end, John wants to finish the survey before we start digging. I'm confident this isn't barbed wire fence. Good. <laughs> <laughs> because there are also an awful lot of pits showing up on our LiDAR picture, and quarry pits can be classic signs of Roman ironworking. So maybe we haven't got a villa here, but a specialist industrial site. So, to help us find out, we've invited an expert in Roman metalworking to join us and he's going to start by looking at one of the pits that seems to have a spoil heap around it. If you look at this, and the, the orangey colour tells us there's a little bit of iron in there, but not yeah. enough to be worth smelting. Right. This is some stuff we found down the road, just in a cutting, oh. and you can see, feel the difference in weight. Look at the colours. Well, I, mean, I, could, I could spot that as yeah. iron straight away. That's, exactly. It's very different to that, isn't well, it? Well, this will occur in bands underneath this yeah. and stuff, so you've got to get this overburden off. <laughs> you've got to get through this, potentially, to, to get... Like that, yeah, have you? So, exactly, yeah, right. yeah. With so many pits to check, it looks like Roger will have his work cut out. But what I find most surprising is that we could have so much industry close to what we suspect is a villa. Interestingly, we're getting evidence that people lived and cooked in the buildings Phil's investigating. Oh, cracking. Absolutely yeah, cracking. 
this mortarium would have been used for grinding food like corn or maize to make bread, and it suggests that we could be close to a kitchen. In fact, we do seem to be getting the sort of finds you'd associate with a Roman villa. The problem is we're not finding very many of them. Everything we'd expect to find on a villa site is here, both in terms of sort of range of material and dates, but in really small quantities. What do you reckon is going on, Stephen? The other way to look at it is to ask the question, what are they doing with their rubbish in the mm. first place? I mean, if, for example, we've got evidence of iron working here, could they be digging pits to extract the ore and then chucking their rubbish down the pits to get rid of it? And that would be a very simple explanation about why there isn't much material on the site full stop. Which is another reason to start digging those pits. Exactly. exactly yeah. yeah. But, and this is typical, just as I point out the shortage of finds, news reaches me that Matt's trench is starting to look really exciting. He's finding huge quantities of stuff, and it's all much posher than we've seen anywhere else. I caused heating flue tile look, with the, with the marks on it where the plaster sticks on. You've also got lots of roofing material, these are, the, these are the, the clay tiles off the roof, one like that, and then a curved one over like that. So, you know, it's all looking much more like a, a sort of high-status building than we thought. Is that painted plaster? Yeah. You've actually got stuff with patterns on it, look, and red patches, and there's even more coming out. Where Matt is, yeah. you've got more of it there, haven't you? There's actually a piece there in the top of this rubble layer with a black painted line across the top. You've got the trench of the day, without any doubt, haven't it's, you? It's coming up with the goods, isn't it? <laughs> we could be thinking about we've got industrial activity here. You know, it's either some furnace or some oven or something like that, a kiln or something. That's why we put the trench here. We yeah. wanted to know what was going on on the inside of the building. And you've nailed it. You've got, you've got something that's, that's giving us activity inside the building. What on earth is that then, Anthony? I have no idea. I've been trying to unravel it for that. Yeah, I mean... You've got something else. Like well, we've got a nice piece of what appears to be possibly a bit of carved stone. This? Well, yeah, but what you can't see, Tony, is that round here... Yeah. It does look like an arm. It really does. I wouldn't mind. If it's Roman and it's carved stone, that would be a big one for us, wouldn't it? Yep. You were the one who was saying, oh, it's very rare to find things like this. It is this. very rare. <laughs> but we have our occasional moments. Yeah. Of what he's uncovered here. Meanwhile, carefully placed in between the ant's nest and the deadly nightshade bushes, Matt's trench is revealing the first glimpse of some sort of posh structure. Can you see the mortar yeah, there? Yeah, coming up, yeah. Yeah, look, there's the edge of another oh, one there. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, that could be a lead into a flue or something. So this would have formed some kind of floor heating or something like that? Yeah, if it's a hypercourse, yeah, it's sort of pili within the room itself. It begins to look ever, ever more structural. The new theory is that this bathhouse is not part of a Roman villa, but built for a manager or overseer who was looking after the ironworks here. Is it possible that we're looking at some overseer here who's working on behalf of the state? Right. And the state, of course, I think, have a very, very large presence in the building underneath Castor Village. Oh, yes, yes. And it could be some procurator there who is not only superintending Fenland, yeah. Um, estates, but iron working estates as well. Yeah, and how far is Castor? Castor's fantastic because it's only a few miles, a few away, miles away. away. And this was also excavated by our antiquarian. Artist spent many years excavating at Castor where he found enormous building complexes uh, underneath the modern village. It's a good idea. Our site, controlled from Castor, could have been one of several iron production centres situated on the outskirts of Dura Breve, the main trading centre in the region. Ermine Street, the M1 of its day, literally ran through the town, and with the River Neen close by, iron could have been dispatched by road or river to almost anywhere in Roman Britain. And if this bathhouse was for an overseer, it looks like he lived in fine style judging by these chunks of painted plaster that show the colour scheme of the walls of this building 1,600 years ago. It's a stark contrast to Phil's trench, where there's no sign of painted plaster or luxuries like underfloor heating. But we did find what looked like a carved stone here yesterday. And now that our experts have had time to carefully examine it, I'm curious to know what they think it is. It's a stone. A stone. A stone. But not just any random stone. 
Phil thinks it's been definitely shaped for some purpose or other. Take a look at this one here. Now, that was found just outside in the angle of the walls there. Yeah. Look how that ordinary stone has been used as a whetstone to sharpen tools. And it just goes to show that every stone you find on a site like this, you have to look at it, think about it, to make sure it's not an artefact. Thanks, I think that's a very good lesson to learn from someone who was sure that was a statue last night. <laughs> it looked very good at the time. But at least Phil's trench and Faye's trench put in here have given us lots of useful detail about the actual buildings in this range. This is a reconstruction of the area where Phil was digging, which we now know was a series of rooms based around a courtyard. We think these were workshops or living accommodation for the people who worked here, a workforce probably of slaves, which would explain why we didn't find any coins or items of real value here. The question now is, have we discovered the main iron smelting area up here on the slightly higher ground? Sorry. I'm on the wall now. Good, so you're on the wall, <laughs> yeah, and I'm but, inside. But I'm still over the floor of another room. Possibly. So you've actually got a wall running with... That still means that could be a door jam, yeah. and that looks like the corner of where there was a door. Oh. So there's a room there, and there's a room there. But no wall. Wall has gone, robbed away. A lot more work's needed here, but we can get some idea of the extent of the bathhouse from the size of this earthwork. And if our theory is right about the link with Castor, then it's possible that our bathhouse was laid out like the one shown here in Artis's picture, which means that we're talking about a building that would have looked something like this. It was probably a standalone facility used by the official overseer on what would have been a state-controlled iron working site. Our dig's certainly given me a newfound respect for this man, Edmund Artis, who was clearly a very good archaeologist for his time, but died before he could publish his written reports. His map of the archaeology, drawn in 1828, has proved to be largely accurate. And it's not just the buildings, but also the pits he recorded that are key to understanding this site. Goodness me, it's a journey to the centre of the earth. <laughs> What we now know is that in Roman times, a lot of the rubbish was being thrown in these pits. So basically, this pit was open at the same time that those buildings were being occupied and, and used. And this looks a bit clayy to me. So is that what they're going for, the clay? Yeah, there's no sign of ironstone or any bands of iron in, uh, ironstone in this at all. So it must be clay for some purpose. And the, the little sort of pock marks and things I can see in there, is this sort of root activity? Well, some of it is, but some of it, some of these dark patches, if you carefully clean them back, you can actually see ads marks or picks marks where they've actually levered the clay out from this pit. Fantastic. We now know not all these pits were dug for iron ore. Many, like this one, would have been dug for clay to build and repair the iron smelting furnaces. So at the end of three days, we can now picture this long-lost Roman settlement as it must have looked in its heyday around 200 AD. What's been hidden in these woods is a massive iron working site, with the furnaces and ore roasting pits on the slightly higher ground, while the mining was going on here, chasing the seam of natural iron ore. The workshops and living quarters were not far away and were very much second class, as mentioned by Edmund Artis. But there was at least one fancy Roman building, a bathhouse, situated well away from the industry here on the eastern side of the site. Hello, my name's John Gator. Time Team is fan funded by Patreon. This vital support helps us to make new episodes. Joining Patreon gives you access to exclusive interviews, 3D models and masterclasses, plus lots more.